In this lecture, we'll be talking about transient analysis. Now, in prior video lectures, we've analyzed these thermal fluid systems, typically assuming steady state behavior. So things just didn't change with time. But of course, in reality, that's not always the case. It's often a good assumption that uh, systems are operating at steady state, but not always. So we're going to talk a little bit about unsteady situations today, or we'll sometimes call this transient analysis. Go ahead and take a look at your screen, and you'll see sort of a funny picture here. This is a picture of canned air. So this is the this is might be used, for example, if you're cleaning your computer keyboard or whatever. You have compressed air inside this can. Press the button, and you get a high stream flow of air coming out of that, and uh, you know you can use it to clean stuff, whatever. But the reason I show it in this particular picture is if you have a can like this, like a spray can, and you discharge it you know, almost all the way, what you'll find is that the can itself actually gets pretty cold. And what we're going to talk about today is related to this. It's a transient analysis. So if you look at what's happening in this can, it's changing with time, right? So the, the mass of air inside that can is decreasing as you discharge it. So it's not in steady state. It doesn't look the same at every t instant in time, but it's changing with time. And so that's why, in then that situation, we call it a transient analysis or an unsteady analysis. And I'm going to talk a little bit later at the end of this video lecture about why that can gets cold. We can do a first law analysis and combine with conservation of mass to explain it. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at the equations for transient analysis. So first of all, Recall that when we say that something's at steady state, it means that the time derivative of whatever, the three dots just means whatever, is zero. So like it could be the time derivative of the mass inside the control volume is zero, the time derivative of the total energy inside the control volume is zero. It's just not changing with time. But if we're dealing with a transient analysis, or one that's not at steady state, or we call it unsteady, then that means that time derivative is not zero. It, it is varying with time. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, we can certainly look at the rate at which quantities are changing with time using our standard form of conservation of mass or the first law of thermodynamics down here. This term right here, if it's an unsteady situation, this term here and this term here would not be zero in those situations. So, for example, if we were filling a can with, uh, or filling a barrel with water, for example, the mass flow rate coming in would be positive. Let's say it's sealed so there's no mass going out, and then you would see that the mass inside the barrel would be increasing with time because this term would be positive, right? So that would be an example of an unsteady kind of analysis. So you can certainly look at how things are changing with respect to time uh, using our standard form of conservation of mass in the first law. So that would give us the rate at which things are changing. But sometimes you want to look at the before and after. You know, we want to see how the total mass has changed, not the rate at which mass has changed, but how much has the mass inside the control volume changed. So the way we can do that is we can integrate this rate form of conservation of mass with respect to time. And when we do that, we'll get this form. So what we're doing is we're just integrating like this term with respect to time, and that'll give us the change in the mass in the control volume. So the delta MCV would be like the mass in the control volume at the final time minus the mass in the control volume at the initial time. So it's just how the mass in the control volume has changed with time. This term, the this is the rate at which mass is coming in through the inlets, that would just be integrated with time. That would just end up becoming how much mass has come in at the inlets. It's just the total mass that's come in to the control volume through the inlets. Similarly, the rate at which mass is leaving the control volume would integrate in time to how much mass has left the control volume in that time period. So this is what conservation of mass now looks like when you integrate it with respect to time. The change in mass inside the control volume is equal to how much mass you've put into the control volume minus how much mass you've taken out of it. It, it makes sense. Okay, You can do a same, the same kind of idea with the first law of thermodynamics. It's a little more complicated. So we have this rate form of the first law. We'll integrate that in time. Now when we integrate this one in time, one of the things we have to be careful of is, is the total enthalpy term. This is the specific total enthalpy. We're going to assume that that specific total enthalpy remains constant with time when I do this integration. And the reason I do that is because 
I can then pull it outside of the time integral when I do the integration. If it varied with time, then I would need to know how this varies with time when I do the integral. So that would just depend on the problem. I, I couldn't write, um, I would just have to leave it as an integral uh, since this would depend on time. But if I assume that this is constant with time, then I can pull it outside the integral. And what we'll get in that case is the following. The rate at which the total energy in the control volume changes with time just becomes the change in total energy within the control volume. So again, it, it would look like, for example, the total energy in the control volume at the final time minus the total energy in the control volume at the initial time. Instead of the rate at which we have heat transfer into the control volume, we would have just the total amount of heat into the control volume. Similarly, the rate at which work is done by the control volume, other than pressure work, that would become the total work done by the control volume on the surroundings by things other than pressure work. And then these terms, these, this, this is the uh, how much total enthalpy comes into the control volume through the inlets. Since I'm assuming the total enthalpy is a constant, that just stays the same here at the inlets. And instead of the rate at which mass is coming in, we get the total amount of mass coming in. So it's similar to this term up here. It's just the total mass coming in at the inlets multiplied by the total enthalpies at each of those inlets. And you have the same thing at the outlets here. Instead of the rate at which total enthalpy is leaving the control volume, what we get is how much total enthalpy is left. It's the mass that is left in how much and multiplied by its specific total enthalpy. We, again, we're assuming that that's a constant. So this is now our sort of before and after expression for the first law. If we're interested in a transient analysis, we could either, again, use the rate form if we want to know the rate at which properties inside the control volume are changing with time, or if we just want to see the before and after we integrate it with time, subject to this, this uh, assumption that the specific total enthalpies remain constant with time, and uh, we get this expression. Again, if, if you're dealing with specific total enthalpies that are changing with time, instead of having this expression, what we would have in that case would be something like this. Let me just uh, write it down here. This, this expression would end up looking like at each of the inlets, you would have the integral of m dot times this expression. You'd have to integrate that with respect to time, and you'd have to know how the, that specific, uh, the, the specific total enthalpy changes with time in order to do the integral. If this isn't constant, you'd have to in, know how that relationship varies with time in order to integrate it. But if you assume it's a constant, then it comes outside the integral, and it just looks like that. Okay, so that's really just the concept. Of course, there are some examples online that you can look at where we use these equations in, um, in application. But let me just talk about that can, the spray can that I talked about at the very beginning of the lecture. So let me just redraw the can here. So here's the can and it's spraying air out. I'm going to make that can, the air inside of it, that's going to be my control volume in there. That's what I'm interested in. And I'm going to go ahead and just try to show you that we can expect that the temperature inside that can is going to change. It's going to decrease with time. So what I'll do is I'll do a first law analysis along with conservation of mass. So the first law, we'll write it in the following way. I'll write the rate form. There's only um, one outlet in this control volume, right? There's just one outlet. There is no inlet. I'm going to write, I'm still going to write the inlet here as well as the outlet, but I'll, I'll just set the inlet term to zero in just a moment. And rather than writing out the specific enthalpy plus kinetic energy plus potential energy, I'll just write it as H sub T for total enthalpy. Okay, so let me simplify our first law here. First of all, we're going to assume that we have an adiabatic process. I'm assuming that there's not much heat transfer going in and out of the can here. In practice, that's not exactly true, but it's a reasonable assumption for sort of a first order analysis here. There is no other work other than uh, pressure work at the outlet, so that term is going to be zero. There is no inlet 
So that term is zero, so no inlet. And this is no other work. Right, we only have an outlet, and then I'll write the outlet like this. This will be just m dot out times the total enthalpy out. All right, so then I'll expand the time rate of change of total energy term in the following way. Remember that that's just d dt of, I'll expand out the total energy in terms of the internal energy, kinetic energy, potential energy. And of course the inside the can here, kinetic energy doesn't really change with time, right? The can is just stationary. Potential energy is not changing either. So these terms will be zero. And so what I'm left with then is the following. The time rate of change of internal energy is equal to minus m dot out times, here I'll expand out the specific total enthalpy coming out. Okay, so this is what we have so far. I'm going to continue on by making a couple of other assumptions here. Uh, one assumption is that I'm going to assume that the potential energy at the outlet here, right at the outlet, is negligible compared to these other terms. I'll also assume that the kinetic energy term is negligibly small. The, you know, it's it's not exactly, it's not zero because, you know, it's coming out with the spray, but it, that kinetic energy would typically be pretty small uh, in comparison to the specific enthalpy term. And so we can neglect that one in comparison to that one. So this will just be minus m dot out times h out. As far as this expression, the internal energy will be, of course, the mass inside the control volume times the specific internal energy within the control volume. Right, because this is the internal energy, and the internal energy is the mass times the specific internal energy. So I'm going to expand that out, and then I'll take the time derivative through these, keeping in mind that the mass inside the control volume is changing with time as well as the specific internal enthalpy. So this will look like the following. When I expand that derivative, okay, so you can see that since both the mass and the specific internal energy change with time, I have to expand the derivative like that. All right, so let me just clean things up a little bit here on this page. So now we have u, c, v, dm, c, v, dt. I'm just rewriting what I worked out just to make it a little cleaner. Okay, so that's my first law analysis so far. Now let me do conservation of mass on the same control volume. So from conservation of mass, we have time rate of change of mass inside the control volume is equal to m dot in minus m dot out. As we mentioned before, there is no mass flow rate in, so that goes to zero. And then, of course, the mass flow rate out is just, there's one outlet, so this is just m dot out. So this conservation of mass tells me the time rate of change of mass in the control volume is equal to minus m dot out. It's decreasing with time since you know, we have an outlet, uh, we have an, one outlet with mass leaving our control volume, so that means the mass inside the control volume is going to be decreasing with time. Now, now that I've written this out, you can see I can substitute that in right up here. So let me do that. Okay, we're getting close now. Okay, so there we are so far. Let me, at this point, combine this term with that term. They both have an m dot out there. So let's write that out. Okay, so we have that. Notice that when I write this expression, we have the minus for the h out, that's right here. And then when I bring this one over to the other side, it becomes a positive, so that's minus times a minus gives you a positive. At this point, let me now expand out the specific enthalpy term. Remember, specific enthalpy is just the 
specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume. Okay, and by the way, when I put these subscripts here, when I say out, what I mean by that is these are the properties right at the outlet. So the out portion is right there. This is the control volume on the inside. So when I write out the out here, it means the properties right at the outlet, right on the edge of that control surface, right? Whereas control volume means all the stuff inside. Now, if you think about it for a moment, as we discharge that air, the properties of the air when it comes out are going to be the same as the properties within the control volume, right? So it's not like the properties change a whole lot from here to the edge of the spray nozzle. It's, it's the same air. So when I write down U out here, that U out's just going to be the same as what's happening inside the control volume. So this is really like U C V plus P little v C V for my specific enthalpy. Now you'll see that this UCV cancels with that one, right? They'll subtract out. And so what we'll get now is the following. That's the expression I was trying to, to get to ultimately. Let's take a look at this now and see what, what we have here. So we have, first of all, the mass flow rate out. Okay, that's a positive quantity. Pressure times specific volume out, those are all, those are both positive quantities, right? You can't, you're, we're not going to have a negative absolute pressure. We're not going to have a negative specific volume. So that means this whole right-hand side here will be less than zero because of the minus sign here. The mass in the control volume, of course, that's always going to be positive. You can't have negative mass. So what that ultimately means then, therefore, the time rate of change of specific internal energy within the control volume is going to be negative. So the, the internal energy is decreasing with the time. Now, if you think about it for a moment, if we're dealing with compressed air, for example, the internal energy is just a function of temperature, which means that if the specific internal energy is decreasing with time, that means that the temperature will also be decreasing with time. So thus, we can show through some analysis that we would expect that the temperature in the can should be decreasing with time as we discharge it, right? So we did that just as a reminder by analyzing the first law, not assuming steady state, so we retain that term, and then we combined it with conservation of mass, and then we also, one other important assumption that we made here was that the properties right at the outlet are the same as the properties within the control volume. That, that the air that's in the can, when it makes its way to the nozzle, it has the same properties as it's just as it's leaving the control volume. So those were the three main points in that analysis to show that the temperature in the can will decrease with time. Okay, take a look at the examples that are posted online so you can see additional problems where we actually do some numerical calculations. We'll end it there.